Through the so-called Brezhnev doctrine, the Soviet Union claimed the right to intervene in the internal affairs of all socialist countries in the event of threats to the socialist undertaking. The USSR invoked this doctrine when it choked the liberation movement in Czechoslovakia in 1968. In 1979, it began a war of conquest in Afghanistan. During this period, the Soviet Union was at the height of its powers militarily and in terms of its foreign policy, but had slipped into deepening economic decline. Beginning in 1963, the Soviet Union paid in gold for grain bought from the United States. The USSR proved to be incapable of keeping up with the scientific and technical revolution taking place in other countries. Her economy revolved mainly around material goods and was wasteful of resources. Raw materials were sold on the world market. Estonia's economic development also began to stagnate. The sharp rise in the price of raw oil that began in 1974 made it possible to continue for some time while carrying on development of military production. The Soviet Union couldn't compete in the arms race, nor was she up to the task of launching a war. It was just a matter of time until the USSR would disintegrate. Father says that there is a precious name you must know, that is Lenin, embellished on a silken flag. For the first time in the history of mankind, the advanced Soviet socialist society had succeeded in solving the nationalities question. A new unit had been forged in the form of the Soviet people. The party began manipulating awareness of the Soviet people from day one in nursery school, preparing it for work and struggle. National and linguistic differences were supposed to disappear in the melting pot that would produce this amalgam of humanity. The Estonian nation was in danger of being turned into a minority. In 1979, Estonians constituted 65% of the population of Estonia. Approximately 10,000 settlers arrived every year, a figure that was four times larger than the birth rate of the Estonian population. Do you ever think of a day when this land is no longer ours? Is it of no concern to you what language you are addressed in? When some people I knew in Russia departed, formerly to Israel, but actually to America, a strong feeling that I would also like to depart overcame me. Maimu Berg has even written a book named Away. It is this feeling that a migratory bird must have when it hears the cries of other birds in the sky above. A feeling you'd like to join them, that is what I felt. It all began in connection with the suppression of the Prague Spring because that evoked empathy in me and many others. The sense of despair was such that thoughts of self-immolation occurred to us. We just didn't want to go on living. That was when the sense of constriction really began. October 3, 1973, the all-union Estonian electrical power station Komsomol Shock Brigade construction project has come online at full capacity. Representatives of 28 nationalities took part of the work, along with 300 enterprises of our fraternal republics. In his festive speech, the first secretary of the Communist Party of Estonia, Johannes Gavin, said that this is a symbol of the friendship and fraternal assistance of the peoples of the Soviet Union. For the third time in a row, Soviet Estonia is among the Union republics that won the all-Union socialist competition. The valuable awards have stimulated a new burst of energy, the wish and the readiness to work even better, even more fruitfully. Back then, the value-added tax was the most important source of income to the state. 
Money was dispersed to the republics from this source of income, depending on the number of projects and events that were planned. We fared rather well in the union-level planning committee as well as the republican planning committee. We managed to receive as much as 60 and even 70 percent and more of the amount of value-added tax that had been collected in the Estonian Republic, sums that Moscow then paid back into our budget. Those who are familiar with history and finance and economics know that the Central Asian Republics, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzia, Uzbekistan, got their value-added tax contributions returned entirely, and they still experience budgetary shortfalls. They then receive subsidies from the union budget. We were never subsidized. I don't regard the payments we received on the basis of our own value-added tax as subsidies. This was something we needed, not unworthy, not a subsidy. It was a normal part of planning activities, a way of contributing to development. The Estonian SSR enjoyed a good position within the Soviet system in terms of her efficiency of production. Having said that, the local leadership was not in charge of Estonia's economy. All union factories were subordinated directly to Moscow. By the same token, Moscow also managed Republican Union enterprises, which produced two-thirds of industrial output. Enterprises that answered to the administration of the Estonian SSR turned out a mere 10 percent of all domestic production. Estonian heavy industry was dependent on imported raw materials, fuel, and labor. The fairly sophisticated electronics and apparatus industry was in the service of the military sector. Environmental concerns were totally ignored. The growth rate of industry fell off and quality deteriorated. The adoption of a market quality, which was intended to improve the situation, ended up being a mere propaganda exercise, something that made the people laugh. Buildings are springing up in the new Lasnama residential district in quick order. 1,400 families have become the happy users of new flats. Still, how happy are they? Udo Malmet, you're an engineer. What do you say about the work of the construction crew? The builders are fast. However, they make errors. There are problems with the roof and the walls, and the quality of the finishing touches leaves a lot to be desired. There are problems with water leaking in. That is the most significant complaint. It is really tough to do anything about it because of fitting issues. The parties responsible try to more or less shift the blame, saying, perhaps, and we'll try to do better, but they're not making any promises. Estonia's agricultural progress came to a halt by the 70s. Enormous and expensive but poorly thought out amelioration projects failed. Areas that had been cultivated earlier went to seed. Heavy tractors destroyed the quality of the agricultural soil. The principles as such weren't all that bad. The biggest mistake they made was to set up those large units, which I have to take some of the responsibility for, since we didn't succeed in resisting the joining of the plots of land. The Minister of Agriculture at that time, Harald Menik, who for a while was the head of the Viljandi model Kolhoz, was also one of the organizers who had an enormous desire to create large agricultural units, but he didn't succeed either. The basic problem with the agricultural units was that they were so large that they became unmanageable. Even Viljandi, which had been a well-known region up until that time, began to go downhill at that point. The construction of the swine raising facility at the Gagarin Models of Hose and Vocational School is now complete.
the extensive use of mineral fertilizers became less and less effective. Animal dung was simply discarded. Large hog waste lagoons polluted the landscape. Estonia had been turned into a backwater of Soviet agriculture. Estonia and Lithuania enjoyed the highest per capita statistical figures for the production of meat and milk in the USSR. The milk and meat that were produced with imported animal feed was then transported out of Estonia for consumption by others. The only things that were left to Estonia were the waste and the squealing of the pigs, so to speak. Moscow decided how much Estonia had to contribute. Local economic bosses kept asking for more feed grain, but the deliveries decreased instead of increasing. Back then, production quotas were what caused us the biggest problems. These were commands that came from above, and I guess the departments of the ministries weren't up to the task of getting these norms reduced. The quotas for milk and milk products, meaning butter and cheese, and also meat, these were so high that we really sent them a lot. Take the large swine raising facility here with 50,000 pigs. There was a period that lasted two or three years where none of the production was left for us. Only the workers at the plant were able to buy pork. The rest was all transported out of Estonia. For one person to be able to milk 110 cows means that there has to be a good working arrangement, one that has been properly planned. Everyone has a job to do. What the economy needed was development, but instead of that we got propaganda and a cult of awards. Medals and red flags were handed out in ever increasing numbers. The heartfelt and fatherly letter written by comrade Brezhnev to the hero of labor, Leda Papes, was a stimulus that brought out the competitive spirit in everyone who was involved in animal husbandry, from the Moscow Oblast to Uzbekistan to Bulgaria. The media published Comrade Brezhnev's letter to Leda Papes, who milks cows at the Vilyanti Sofos. The freshly anointed hero of socialist labor takes a new responsibility upon herself to get the cows, on the average, to produce 5,300 kilograms of milk per year. There weren't enough goods available to provide for people living in the countryside. By the mid-70s, foodstuffs began to fall into short supply in Estonia, which was in keeping with the general tendency toward shortages in the Soviet economy. This trend kept getting worse. The demands that the consumers place upon the service sector continue to rise on an ongoing basis. The ability to remain aware of these expectations in an objective and prompt manner works to the benefit of a propagandist, particularly if he or she is also the head of an enterprise. Propagandists have to be able to deal with the rumors that abound, disseminated as they are by our enemies. There may be rumors about prices going up or about the short supply of one product or another. In such cases, the customers usually purchase more than they need. When that happens, a prompt and knowledgeable response on the part of our distribution network and our workers is really vital. Thanks to our awareness, we have been able to parry all of these attacks. There has always been an adequate supply of goods. It is the consumer who suffers by piling up stocks at home. Ivan Kepin, who remained at the helm of the party for 28 years, managed to skillfully navigate the corridors of Moscow and the intrigues of Tallinn. In 1978, Karl Weiner replaced him in the leader's role. Now we found a joint platform, one that enabled us in Estonia to begin undermining the foundations of the Soviet Union. In 1972, we succeeded in publishing the program of the Estonian Democratic Movement. That was our second move. The first move was the memorandum addressed to the UN. That was the one single best-known step taken by the Democrats. 
The memorandum was intended as a cry of despair, something intended to draw attention to the unfortunate status of Estonia. A former member of the League of Nations had fallen prey to an aggressor. It was a debt of honor incumbent upon the UN, as the successor to the League of Nations, to help undo this injustice. Expressing the will of the people of Soviet Estonia and carrying out the task the people have assigned, the Supreme Soviet of the Estonian SSR prepares to adopt the new constitution of the Estonian Soviet Socialist Republic. We all witnessed how much work went into the discussion of the bill. It was a discussion of important issues that really matter. During the course of the work, some people's deputies made proposals on how to improve the draft. The lead committee recommends that these be incorporated into the wording of the bill. This provides us with the opportunity to improve the draft constitution for the Republic. The Secretary of the Central Committee of the ECP and the People's Deputy, Vaino Veljas, summarized the work of the session of the lead committee. After that, with Chairman Johannes Lott holding the gavel, the Supreme Soviet proceeded to adopt the new constitution of the Estonian SSR. Who of the People's Deputies is for the adoption of the constitution of the Estonian SSR? Please vote. Thank you. Who was opposed? No one. Any abstentions? None. Comrade deputies, the Supreme Soviet of the Estonian SSR has unanimously adopted the constitution of the Estonian Soviet Socialist Republic. The new constitution of the Estonian SSR was a replica of the new constitution of the USSR. It was the sovereignty of the USSR that was preeminent throughout the territory of the Soviet Union. Union laws were paramount. Nowhere was there a reference to the language of state. The 1980 Olympic Games took place in Moscow. Since the USSR was conducting an imperialistic war in Afghanistan, the democratic nations conducted a boycott and arranged an alternative set of games in Atlanta. The leaders of the Estonian SSR, concerned about the image of their puppet state, managed to have Tallinn picked as the site for the sailing regatta of the Olympics. Along with the regatta came additional state funding for the construction of Olympic facilities the Pirita Sailing Center, the Olympia Hotel, the Television Tower, and the new airport were all built at the same time, as well as the V.I. Lenin Arena. The arena was recently picked as one of the five ugliest structures of Tallinn. The sailing regatta didn't attract much international attention, nor did it turn out to be a bridge to the world or a window on the world. Opportunities to associate with relatives from abroad turned out to be a better window on the world, along with tourists from other countries, and a similar function was served above all by Finnish television. The party fought heatedly against the enormously damaging influence of the latter, although a direct ban on watching Finnish TV was never imposed. The organs of state security, the KGB, began to seem much less horrifying to outwardly loyal men and women in the street than they had been 30 or 40 years before. The majority of their attention was now turned to active opponents of the regime, the dissidents. Over the course of time, I began to gather materials that might turn out to be useful. The idea was to research what was actually going on in society. The data in the official sociological studies were not trustworthy. Still, there was some material available, although the compilers had to be careful. But still, they were workers on the ministerial level. So I gathered these materials bit by bit. One fine day a man named Johan Talve appeared. We first met in 1975, and he visited again later. We talked. I decided that I would provide him with materials that pertain to Soviet Estonia, the things that were taking place here. 
It was clear that he was doing work for Radio Free Europe, and that was what I needed. From then on, it became possible to send all sorts of materials abroad and to write letters at the same time, meaning analytical overviews of what was going on here, and also to steal documents and statistical and sociological facts and figures. It took a long time, but finally a change came about when Karl Weino came to power. Well, he was a truly objectionable character. Towards the end, people had almost begun to accept Gavin, but that was unacceptable to the folks in Moscow. A personnel change was made. Ristlan and his kind that was also unpleasant. That was followed by unrest among the young people in Tallinn and its suppression and all of those events. That was what brought about the so-called Letter of Forty. On September 22, 1980, young people ran wild in Kadriorg when the rock group Propeller wasn't allowed to play. On October 1st and 3rd, thousands of students demonstrated in Tallinn. The police beat many of them brutally, hundreds were arrested. The young people were upset because of Russification in the schools and demanded that the new Minister of Education, Elza Grechkina, resign, for she was in charge of implementing this policy. On October 13, 1978, Moscow had adopted a secret decree pertaining to the intensification of the teaching of Russian. The shaping of the Russian-speaking Soviet citizen, a person without ethnic awareness, was to be carried out through the policy of Russification. The language of people's friendship and cooperation was forced upon people. In regard to the decrees, we were obligated to respond to them. Of course, we discussed them within the upper echelons of the Ministry of Education. We made our own decisions in this context. Even so, the first document that our top officials adopted during my tenure was the decision about the teaching of Estonian language as a mother tongue and the teaching of Estonian literature as native literature. That was the first decision. Then came Estonian as a second language in the Russian schools. It was only after that, cautiously and taking our time, that we took these rather robust and final decisions. We did it, but we'd taken precautions first. In the broadest sense, of course, these things did have a certain influence. The increasing pressure of Russification and the ham-fisted quashing of the student demonstrations caused the intelligentsia to protest. At the end of October, a group of intellectuals addressed an open letter to the newspapers in defense of the Estonian language and national culture protesting against the bilingualism that was being one-sidedly expected of Estonians. The number of signatories is what gave the document its name, the Letter of Forty. At the same time, the successes of the Polish free trade union movement Solidarity inspired Eastern Europe and also influenced Estonia. Comrades, a foodstuffs program is being worked out at the initiative of Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev, which is designed to ensure the development of the entire agro-industrial sector and to definitely result in a sufficient supply of food.
pima tüüstuse töötajate. Ehitajate tänane tüüssaavud. A steady stream of words about a highly structured, developed and mature socialist society and a state working on behalf of the people, as well as promises, were designed to conceal the decline that was taking place. The Party Congress in 1986 promised to double the economic potential of the state during the five years to come and to provide every family with an apartment or house. Allow me on behalf of the Central Committee of the Estonian Communist Party and the Government of the Republic to congratulate you again and to express the conviction that you will always contribute all of your strength and energy to the attainment of the new objectives of the party. I wish you all success in approving the decisions of the 26th Party Congress. November 15th, 12.45. The geriatric leadership in Moscow went through four successions of national leaders during the span of two years and four months. Brezhnev, Andropov and Chernenko were followed by Mikhail Gorbachev, who was a mere 54 years old. His objective was to strengthen the socialist system by increasing the tempo of economic development and by relaxing political pressure. Glasnost proceeded at a faster pace in Moscow and Leningrad than it did in the Union Republics. Karol Vaino, the party leader of the ESSR, was at the very front line of the war against imperialistic ideology along with his brutal lieutenants and the Bureau of the Central Committee of the ECP went about business as usual in the usual Bolshevik mentality. I was totally blacklisted for a year, no radio or TV appearances. I was also not allowed to set foot on the stages of any of our theaters. This ban was sent to all of the departments of culture of all of the regions and even to the houses of culture, which effectively kept me from performing with bands. I wasn't allowed to perform comedy acts, a total ban on appearing anywhere. And then the so-called elections rolled around again. An agitator came to visit. Hello, elections are going to be held. So what? Well, do you intend to come and cast your vote? No, we never vote, out of principle. This all took place in Russian. You must be kidding. I was under the impression that it's a voluntary act. What do you mean, voluntary? Yes, voluntary. Goodbye. And then it turned out that this guy had previously been a Central Committee instructor. Before the 45th anniversary of the restoration of Soviet power in Estonia, a day of the Estonian SSR was held at the Foreign Ministry of the Soviet Union. A press conference was given by Indrek Tome, first deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers of the Estonian SSR. Indrek Tome and other leading representatives of our republic answered many questions. The chairman of the presidium of our Supreme Soviet, Arnold Rüttel, showed foreign journalists visiting Estonia all that has been accomplished. He spoke of problems and plans for the future. Yes, conveying information out of the country was kind of funny because you could only do it by telephone, knowing all the while that the calls were being monitored. That was a troublesome undertaking. There was also the method of taking photos of the magazines we produced. Then there were couriers who visited from Finland, Sweden and beyond. To an extent, we were able to maintain contact with the media. There were correspondents from Swedish newspapers in particular who took an interest in us at that point in time. Two whom I'd been in contact with were required to leave the Soviet Union after I was arrested. 
The foreign journalists were accredited in Moscow. They had to have permission to visit Estonia. In these cases, tricks would be resorted to. The person they were supposed to meet with would be stopped from going to the meeting. They would just make it impossible to meet with the journalist. It seems rather strange now in retrospect. How could something like this be possible? But it was truly frightening, and the powers that be and the structures of repression made maximal use of this, you could say to the hilt. By then, no one was being killed or shot anymore. There were, of course, cases where people died in the camps, like the case of Yuri Kuk and some others, but those tended to be unfortunate exceptions. Direct and brutal physical violence of the Stalinist kind was no longer being used in the 80s, but the fear of brute violence was still being cultivated. You would hear rumors that one thing or another might happen to you. Now that time has passed, it seems safe to say that it couldn't really have happened, but... Aga samas kultiveeriti selle sama toore vägivalla hirmu. Nad ikka siit sealt jõudsid sinu nii kuuldused, et sulle võib juhtuda see või teine või kolmas. Ja nüüd tagant järgi nii adark olla, et noh, et ei saanud ju juhtuda, aga noh, jah. For me, a true breakthrough occurred in 1983 on January 13th, when Otto von Habsburg and his colleagues passed a resolution in the Euro Parliament in support of the restoration of Estonian, Latvian and Lithuanian independence. A decision that was taken in response to a letter signed by 45 Estonian, Latvian and Lithuanian citizens. After that, the Estonian KGB swung into action. Mark Niklus had already been arrested earlier. A special detachment was dispatched to Tartu. First, Laglaparek was arrested, then Arvo Pesti, and during the fall in September of 1983, I was taken into custody. I was charged with anti-Soviet agitation and propaganda under the basis of the second clause of that paragraph, which specified imprisonment for 10 plus 5, and that was the sentence that was passed, 10 years in a special regime camp plus 5 years in banishment. If the Soviet Union hadn't disintegrated, I wouldn't have been released until 1998. In Tallinn, before being sent to the camps on the first occasion, the KGB workers who sent me off to bear my sentence said, you'll do your time in return. Do your time like the others, nothing really bad will happen. This time they said, you're not going to come back from there alive, you filthy swine. At the end of the 60s, a new type of resistance began to take shape in Estonia. Critics of the regime tried to selflessly inform the world that Estonia was occupied and bereft of human rights. A memorandum to the UN was written in 1972, followed by the Baltic Appeal on August 23, 1979. Estonian freedom fighters maintained contact with other dissidents in the Baltic states, Moscow and Leningrad. However, the movement against the mining of phosphorite in Viruma province, which came sharply to the fore due to a television broadcast on February 25, 1987, turned into a public action. It morphed into a general struggle for independence and took the form of opposition to the catastrophic policies of Moscow and the ECP. A great game now began. At the outset, the people were opposed to open pit mining at Tolze. They said that it might be possible to mine underground, which diverted people's attention. Then the Rakvere deposits were discovered, and they were even more extensive. At that point, they said, why fool with Tolze at all? The Rakvere site is much bigger. This was typical of the Soviet obsession with all that is big, and the attention was now focused on Rakvere. That was in 1981. You could say the first phosphorite war took place during the 1972-1981 period. 
That was the really difficult struggle. And the next phase was from 1981 to 1987. By then there was less actual danger since the Soviet Union had imploded in an economic sense. At that stage enough evidence had been amassed to prove that mining the phosphorite would have been impossible in any event. What would have transpired if we'd begun mining the Rakvera deposits, which are really enormous? The thickness of the phosphorite layer there at its deepest is 12.1 meters. Think about that. Up to 12.1 meters of phosphorite with average readings of 5 meters. Had this actually been done, much of northeastern Estonia would have dried up because mining requires that the water be pumped out. We would have been left with the mining cavities. The Rakvera region is also our best farming area. All of this would have caused a lot of pollution and on top of that it would have meant the arrival of an enormous number of immigrants. You will recall that a city designed to house 20,000 people would have sprung up next to Rakvera. People from a number of walks of life discussed the mining of phosphorite at the Turu club. Pressure has to be constant so that the people at levels where decisions are made understand that we are fighting for our lives. We aren't joking. We're not selfish and it's not that we're not willing to share. We are in mortal fear. We have to make that abundantly clear, so clear that everyone understands. The Soviet system simply expended itself during the Cold War because of the toll that the Star Wars race took. Oil prices fell during the 80s and that also drained her strength and lessened her aggressiveness. Treaties were signed with other countries within the framework of detente. The party, sensing the weakness of the state, began experimenting with the forms of socialism in 1985. Perestroika, which means restructuring and renewal, and glasnost, which means openness, these didn't bring economic results, but they did cause liberalization and an end to the political pressure of the regime. This meant that the old deep-seated fear of Soviet power began to quickly dissipate. This led to massive and broad uprisings against the system and spelled the rapid approach of the end.